Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and after the Battle of Arkansas Post, McClernand headed back to the Mississippi to join Grant in the taking of Vicksburg, a major obstacle in the path of Union dominance of the Mississippi River. Ulysses S. Grant, bent on securing the Mississippi River for the Union, mulled over multiple plans for the capture of Vicksburg. Although it was not his favorite plan, the year previous, another Union commander attempted to build a canal across the DeSoto Peninsula to bypass the city and safely transport men, gunboats, and supplies to the south side of Vicksburg. He decided to continue the canal, mostly to keep from sitting idle all spring. For this job, he chose McClernand. The politician turned general directed Sherman to start work on the canal. To see to the safety of the men, he ordered a reconnaissance of the area and placed guards along the canal's path. The closest major threat on the west side of the river lay about 40 miles away. Confederates still held much of the river below Vicksburg, so McClernand placed artillery downriver from the city to interfere with the river travel that aided the rebel war effort. McClernand had hardly been on the job for five days when the rains began to come down. He reported on January 26th that the heavy rains led to three breaks in the levee aiding in the canal's construction. Confederate guerrillas also plagued digging crews as they tolled away in the swamps. McClernand dispatched troops to stand guard as the crews continued their work. He worked effectively with Admiral Porter to protect parties of men in search of food, including fresh beef in the Louisiana countryside. He remained in constant communication with Grant regarding his efforts to comply with the order to build the canal. During this early stage of the project, Colonel Warren Stewart, a member of McClernand's staff, was killed. McClernand wrote to Governor Yates and asked him to bury the man with full military honors in the plot next to his in the cemetery in Springfield, and also included a blank check to the governor to cover any and all expenses associated with fulfilling his request. Also in January, Grant's authority expanded. He now basically commanded both sides of the Mississippi River, in Mississippi as well as in Arkansas. McClernand challenged some of Grant's actions around this same time. Grant issued orders directly to Sherman and other subordinates to McClernand, without going through the proper channels. McClernand wrote to Grant accurately informing him that by him directly communicating with officers under his direct supervision, Grant made him ignorant of vital information. He also stated that the Army cannot have two commanders. McClernand was still operating as though he commanded the entire river expedition, and when Grant formally took command of all operations along the waterway, it knocked McClernand back down to Corps Command. Again, he thought this went against the presidential directive for him to operate against Vicksburg along the river, making him feel upstaged by Grant. The directive by the president contained a caveat that gave Grant ultimate authority over operations in that area, so McClernand had no legal standing. Grant tasked McClernand with garrisoning the west bank of the river, giving him 7,000 more men in order to complete the task. Still, the Illinois politician attempted to get out from under his commander and exercise independent command. He wrote to Grant and Lincoln about operating against Arkadelphia, Arkansas, knowing the area acted as a supply depot for Confederate forces west of the Mississippi. He also asked the president to clarify who possessed authority over the Vicksburg campaign. Lincoln ignored the correspondence. Grant objected to the plan because it would take vital resources away from his operations against Vicksburg. As the Corps told away in the Louisiana swamps, disease began to run its course through the camps. Making the job of smallpox and malaria easier was the fact that soldiers did not keep their camps clean. Plus, lax regulations regarding hospitals resulted in substandard care. Upon hearing about this, McClernand ordered all hospitals under the purview of the division quartermasters. Officers were using hospital tents and buildings as personal quarters and kitchens, which McClernand quickly brought to an end. Disease still persisted in the camps, but it did get progressively better when the soldiers implemented McClernand's directives. By late March, Grant sought another way to get his army south of Vicksburg. McClernand would take the lead on an expedition from Richmond, Louisiana to New Carthage, Louisiana, then eventually to Hard Times across from Grand Gulf. He took two divisions and encountered only small Confederate resistance, informing Grant that the route was made difficult by the bayous, but could be used to march the army to the Mississippi River, south of Vicksburg. McClernand ordered the building of bridges and corduroy roads to facilitate the transportation of men and goods across the watery landscape. 
He also directed telegraph lines to be strung along the route to ensure the quick transmission of information. Despite the outward appearance, the McClernand-Grant feud continued to simmer. Behind the general's back, McClernand wrote that Grant was a drunk and could be incapacitated after a drunken bender. McClernand's corps moved to hard times in preparation for the movement across the Mississippi River to attack the fortifications around Grand Gulf. The gunboats and transports steamed past the fortifications at Vicksburg and Grand Gulf. The fortifications at Grand Gulf were too formidable to take with direct assault, so Grant directed McClernand to move to Disharoon's plantation south of Grand Gulf and from there be transported by Porter's transports to Bruinsburg, Mississippi. On April 30, 1863, McClernand and his command reached the east side of the Mississippi River, a feat they had struggled for the past four months to accomplish. On their way to Port Gibson, a small Confederate force confronted McClernand's corps, but the corps commander had no way of knowing the exact size of the enemy force in front of them. Grant ordered McClernand to take the infantry and artillery over, anticipating a guarded beachhead, but once McClernand's command began moving along the roads to Port Gibson, the lack of cavalry prevented him from knowing what lay ahead of his marching columns. The Confederates massed a little over a thousand men to combat the 13,000-man corps of McClernand. They occupied good ground and the tangled forest and bayous hid their true numbers. When Grant arrived on the scene, he even called up for reinforcements, thinking that the major enemy force lay just in front of the Union lines. When McClernand ordered a general advance, the Confederates began to give way, but not without stubborn resistance. Aides to Grant encouraged the army commander to congratulate McClernand, but Grant refused, still fuming over McClernand's questioning of his authority as well as other interactions. When night came, the Union soldiers bedded down, and McClernand prepared for an assault the next morning. When daylight came, McClernand found no enemy. They left her in the night. The Union soldiers marched into Port Gibson and set up repairing bridges destroyed by Confederate forces that would lead them to Jackson. With the bridge completed, for the first time in over a month, McClernand's corps did not lead the Army of the Tennessee. McPherson's corps would push further into Mississippi, while McClernand's command recuperated in Port Gibson. Confederate Commander John Pemberton knew the noose was tightening around his installations around Mississippi. He moved his headquarters from Jackson to Vicksburg to facilitate faster communication and instructed Grand Gulf to be abandoned. The Union Army now pushed further into Mississippi, using the Big Black River to their north and Bayou Pierre to the south to screen their movements. Charles Dana, a former journalist for the Chicago Tribune, now Special Commissioner for the War Department, journeyed with Grant's command to provide information to the Secretary of War about various generals and campaigns. Although he came to like Grant, Dana criticized McClernand at every turn. He consistently derided the politician as slow in moving his troops and described him as almost inept in his abilities. Dana let personal feelings get in the way of correct reporting. McClernand was not a perfect general, but he followed Grant's orders in the campaign and met success after success in his battles against Confederate forces. Nevertheless, the derogatory statements made their way to the White House, and they would continue to do so through the campaign.